Okay. See, we got a huge audience in there. It's not the smallest I put in the two certainly not the largest. And they say if you're an educator, you really shouldn't have not many people. It's just one on one, and it's a large group, and you're supposed to still bring your aid. But I have been retired for the last few years, so I've only been speaking fast on the speaking circuit for a little bit. I did this for 30 years, about 30, 35 weeks a year, traveling the world, speaking on best practices and things like that. So I took a couple of years off, and I'm now I'm back. A lot has changed since I've been back, mostly the political environment, so I'm pretty on the West, not on there. But within our industry, a few things have changed too. So I got to get back to Washington, D.C., where I spent many, many years helping to write the uh, American standards for Amy and helping Canada put the Canadian standards. Going to get back to Aaron and all these great, wonderful conferences where you're always going to see and talk about energy side of things. That's kind of fun. I'm just not going to travel 30, 35 and see around and do that. Just selectively pick a few places. And this is the first one I started speaking at a year ago uh, here in New York for today. So I appreciate them inviting me back. It, it's always good to be asked to come back. It you know says something. It doesn't say everything, but it says something. Maybe you screwed up last time. I'm going to give you a second chance. Mm -hmm. But uh, I want to give you some value for your time here today because it's important. And I, I want to talk about something you just don't think about a lot, but more, more and more healthcare facilities uh, over the years have called me up and said, well, no, we've got plenty of now. I went over there and they said, tables up. And they're doing everything wrong. They said, of course they are. They're like a decade behind where you were. Remember 10 years ago, we were doing everything wrong? Yeah, but we're so much better now, Chuck. They said, well, you're a lot. You're not quite there yet. But they haven't had that. So they are still in the stomach. No one really come back and saw how they're doing things. First, you probably have done this. And you're probably like me. That when you visit your own private doctor's office or dental office or the veterinary office, you know they're reprocessing medical devices. You know the importance of that. So you've probably done your own audits, right? Because <laughs> that's what I was. I mean, I didn't I didn't make sure my tattoo parlor, my son's tattoo parlor had our father. I was traveling one year, my son turned 18, John Henry. I'm trying to forget his southern name, I'm from Alabama. I live in New York, but I'm from the great state of Alabama, so I talk so much better than any other New Yorker. And that's the reason why. If I get back from a trip and Jack tells me that, that he's going to get a tattoo and his buddy Justin, and I said, okay, really? Um, I just read an article on the plane, literally on the way home, that was talking about a survey in Houston, Texas. Amongst 321 college age students, 38% of my hepatitis did not know. What did they all have in common? Tattoos, just like we were just talking earlier. I haven't got my first tattoo yet. I'm playing them because you know, you got to do that. Anyways, uh, I'm on my bucket list. So anyways, I'm trying not to panic, and I said to my son, John Henry, I said, so where are you going? He said, oh, we're going down the uh, downtown uh, Rochester. This is what we're being. I said, and how did you select them? He said, well, yeah, they have really cool designs, and they're cheap. With great criteria, right? Great criteria. So I'm thinking on my feet real quick. I said, well, John, I said, take a um, What if I offer the paper to tattoo myself? Could I select the facility? He says, what are you going to do, audit them? Yep. Because that's what I've been doing for 30 years. I've been visiting healthcare facilities throughout the United States, North America. In the last 10 years of my career throughout the world, doing audits, mock surveys of their instrument reprocessing, their cell processing errors, things like that. So I spent a lot of time in the OR, I spent a lot of time in the cell processing, that's why I do for a living. So anyways, um, as a good, I knew he was going to be a good businessman when my son John Henry turns to me and said, well, you're paying my buddy too. So yes, I did. So anyways, I went out and visited about 10 facilities in Rochester, New York. I'm here to tell you there were two facilities that were doing a really good job. Not because there were any guidelines, standards, or, or you know, recommendations. They just thought it was smart enough, infection control-wise, not to get sued. Maybe they talked to the local hospital about how should they do, be doing things. Should they have to sterilize? And so they were, the other day, I'd say the ancient Egyptians were practicing better infection control. They were a mess. Anyway, so that's what happened. Three years later, I come back to my daughter, Mary, who was alive in my life. I'm running up to say, Yeah, I got a tattoo, but I'm not in that same place. And I must have looked white as a sheep. She said, What's wrong? What's wrong? I said, I had an audit in three years. I don't know if they're doing things right. And then she turned white. It was one of those comedy moments where she said, What do you do? I don't know. What do you think? I said, Look at her. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. You know, fortunately, they were still doing things right. Not because of any guidelines and standards, it's because of three years. People just basically thought it was a white thing to do. And so you'd like to think everybody in healthcare feels that way too. Here's what I found in my career. 
Everybody cares in healthcare. Up until the point that it means and means. After that, they're willing to take all kinds of shortcuts. So make sure that they don't take those shortcuts. They need some kind of bills. And in the hospitals, you get that with your surgeons. But your private office, your clinics, they typically are not. I actually had to interview three different oral surgeons just to select one that was mostly going to be right to have a root canal next Thursday. I was supposed to have it done three months ago. I contacted the local health department, something I've never done in my career. I said, listen, I'm a little concerned. I've been visiting dental offices in Rochester, New York, and there are lousy, they're awful. I thought they were doing much better. I used to go in and visit them offices. They were doing much better in different parts. These people, some people are not. I mean, I, had, I picked up an issue that was waiting to be used on it. I had to clean it. Man, I've been cleaning it now. I said, who do I complain about? Because historically, I would always work with the facility, but I've had these multiple facilities. I hear the local health department, you know what we told you? Oh, we don't go and visit them. We just go visit the hospital. I said, well, who are they? He said, we'll talk to the local dental society. I said, well, wait a minute. They're, I don't even know if they're a member of the society, and they won't do anything unless they're a member. And then you're asking them to have a box guarded the canal. That doesn't make any sense. So I'm still trying to figure out who in Rochester, New York. I can contact it and ask them to give them advice on how they may want to increase their service, increase their inspection, because it's greatly needed. Because what do they have there? They have tabletop sterilizers. But there's also tabletop sterilizers in your dental office, right? Where your family goes, where you go. And then the veterinary office, where you take their animals. And the medical facility, and the laboratory. They're all over the place, they're everywhere. So I have a validation testing lab. I validated and, and helped get FDA clearance that almost all the brands that are sold here in the United States and North America. Not all of them, it's just about them. So I know a lot about what they're supposed to do. But let's talk not just about the sterilizer, but what about just common errors in reprocessing up until it gets to the sterilizer and then after it leaves the sterilizer. So this is really what I wanted to speak to today. Why are best practices so important? How do you, how do you reach out to those people who only want to buy them? They feel like it, or where it's convenient for them. Because I mean, there's nothing about infection prevention and control. There's nothing about it. And if they're only going to practice it when it's convenient, then most of the time they won't be doing it. And then we want to identify some common errors. And I'd like to talk to you about some solutions because I always hate it when speakers get up here and talk to you about everything you're doing wrong. Don't offer any solutions. You know, help us. That's why you're here, right? To build it up. That's why when you're back in your facility, you're trying to think is there anybody out there to help? You need to be able to have some context. I've got a few business cards up here. You're welcome to take one if you like. They're also on the slides, things like that. But this is something I've always believed in. And this is how I answered that surgeon that was on the airplane with me or, or who's, who's um, at the hospital after a survey, mock survey. Anybody who basically was doing things right some of the time, but not most of the time, all the time. I said, you know, best practice should be complied with in any profession because they reflect the values of the profession. But in healthcare, infection prevention best practices ensures patient safety. It's one of our greatest help is healthcare acquired infections in AI. Then you go on to talk to them about how the catastrophic effects they have. But they still don't care about this happening to someone that's not qualified. That's how you look at it. A lot of times some people. My father died of healthcare acquired infection years ago. It, it's not that it, it helped me out of our health, it really solidified me the fact that these things can do that. You know, the statistics sound interesting. About 5,000 people a day pick up a germ in the So we almost 300 die today of that germ they picked up today, and then tomorrow and the next day, back every day. It's just catastrophic. I don't quite understand why people in healthcare don't care all the time. But the fact of the matter is they care some of the time. Some people care most of the time. But it's almost impossible to work with people who care all the time. And if you're that person who does that, this industry gets very frustrating. It gets very frustrating because when you're not watching, you're taking shortcuts, either intentionally or unintentionally. It's still a shortcut. I like to believe it's unintentional. So I just visit facilities. I've probably been in over 2,500 facilities in my career. First shift, second shift, third shift. I used to pull the all-nighters. You know, remember back in college, you're cramming for a horse for a test, you're just pulling all nighters. That's how I used to come to the show. So I want to see what's going on in the morning, the afternoon, late at night, and very early in the morning. The only way to do this is to actually observe. Everyone thought I was crazy because you know what I'm saying. 
that I've been some of the most prestigious hospitals in our industry. Two o'clock in the morning, you don't even think you're in the same facility you were at eight o'clock in or two in the afternoon. Because people do things differently. And the people who are taking shortcuts <laughs> late at night almost always understand. They just didn't have the training that you they should have. When you think about vendors who do training, how many of them don't know all matters anymore? Back in the day, it was common. Hey, okay, that's it's part of the job. Nowadays, are you kidding me? <laughs> no, I'll just come back the next day. What about people on vacation? Well, then you just mess that. Someone else out without sick, she didn't get the answers. Well, why didn't your vendor come back in and make sure you got 100% training? So there's a lot of people who just don't know what they don't know. It's that person who doesn't care, that does not need to be in healthcare. You need to show them the way out. Don't let the door hit you on the butt on the way out. And so I really think that proper medical device reprocessing is a critical aspect of infection prevention. And the reason I feel that way is behind, behind every instrument is a patient. I think you probably feel that way too, or you wouldn't be here. Unfortunately, the breaches have occurred and it's in the national news. We used to always talk about patient safety and maintaining their accreditation. What about keeping your facility out of the national news because you have not been following best practices? That can and does happen to facilities all the time. You don't want to wake up tomorrow and find that the facility you work at or the facility your family goes to have been taking shortcuts because they all do it, and some of them get caught. The rest of them haven't gotten caught yet, because there's somebody, we haven't had an expert walk in there to actually observe the point of use all the way back to point of use, but they've been complying properly or not. And it's not the routine devices that they're gonna be caught on. It's the complex devices, the ones that are very challenging, very difficult. So, point of use, reprocessing error, and quality assurance, just in a nutshell, what I want to speak with you today. And this is applicable from the hospital setting right into the clinical setting. Let's review just some 10 common practices that are not best practices that I observe. And although the tabletop sterilizers are commonly are focused primarily in the clinical use, many times I can find them in hospitals. I was at a hospital not too long ago where they had a dry heat sterilizer in the sterile processing department. They weren't using it properly, and the consumables weren't even validated for it. But hey, they were reprocessing instruments, and they were doing the best they can with what they had. We just hadn't researched it very much. <clears throat> but due to the constraint of today's presentation, I'm going to focus on steam sterilization. That really is dominating our marketplace. You can speak to me individually about any other sterilizer you come across or they hear about. So number one is transporting devices in, the, in an open tray. They haven't quite got that message in proper transport. Okay, after all, it's, it's the operatory, it's the surgical area is here. They're only taking it down there. It's not very far. I'll just do it quickly that way. But what a best practice, what did the standards say? Not only do they remove gross soil point of use, but they're also transported in a sealed container. So if your surveyor is expecting to see that in the hospital setting, what do you think they're expecting to see in the clinical setting? They're expecting to see something. After all, the instrument doesn't know where it is. Neither, neither do microbes. They don't know, they don't care where they are. So we have the same level of concern. But they haven't had any oversight, so typically you're gonna find this. In fact, you're gonna find this all the time. And so they don't understand this. So you have to educate them on this. And that's not going to be convenient. They're going to push back. Well, we've always done it like this. So you'll talk to them about patient safety. You'll talk to them about survey, maintain their accreditation. You'll talk about making sure you don't show up in the national news. Any one of those three things that motivate them to do a proper, I'm fine with. You like to think that all three does, but whatever motivates them to do it properly. Second one, just wiping the instruments versus using an approved detergent and water. This is what happens routinely in the dental practice. I've personally observed it, okay? And so they're just wiping it. They'll take like a cabicide or whatever brand like, and after it's been used to it, they're just gonna wipe it down and have it ready for the next patient. Especially if they don't put them in sterilization bags. I had my nails done the other day because I was working with a dye, and they got out of my cream nails, and my wife said, oh, you still have your nails? Sure, okay. So I'm like, I mean, yeah, it's amazing what they can do. But they actually brought the tools out that they were going to use in a sterilization bag. Some of you told them that they should package their instruments after you, you know, that you clean the package. They didn't tell them to sterilize them, but they told them to package them. So they were so excited that they brought an unsealed sterilization bag with some tools out. And it wasn't sealed, of course, the indicator didn't change. It's reusable. But they got a sterilization. So this is a good example of somebody doesn't want to know what they don't know, right? Someone said, hey, you should be using a sterilization package. 
but they have a sterile nature about it. Interesting. So what, what is your male salon? Do you go to one? Men? Women? Do you know? Well, does a loved one go to one? You might want to talk to You find out all the things, right? I don't know if your wife might question that all the time. Yeah. Where she says, hey, I feel like this place is a dirty, and it concerns her. Absolutely. I would have never thought personally to go into the water. Absolutely. And they're doing pedicure too, right? You get wet and you're in that water, and that water is not clean because they forgot to clean it. So again, there's some that are following best practices, some of the time, most of the time, all the time. You want to make sure we can go through something all the time. And just for full transparency, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what should they be doing? Well, what is best practice? Well, they're supposed to separate and clean the devices based on IFUs. You say IFU to somebody in a clinical setting, it's just like I said to you guys 18 years ago when I said IFU. You said, you said IFU to me? What did you say, Chuck? I said, no, I didn't say that. I wasn't doing that. I didn't say that. I said instructions for use. I have to. You're going to hear about it the rest of your career. In fact, it's going to drive you crazy because I just came to the gaming meetings and someone was complaining that these new devices don't have instructions. And should they have instructions, FDA? Chuck, you're testing that. Should they? Yes, they should have validated instructions. Well, then let's write it in the standards. You must have written validated instructions for all these devices. You know that it does work for your existing devices too, not just the zip up. You know the Pandora box should open up your device. It's a good time to be a testing lab because no one knows what they don't know. And so, what do we find? We find these four types of IFUs out there. The ones that don't exist all of a sudden proud that because we've been doing this forever. Dr. So and so brought it from his house and it doesn't have an IFU. It doesn't have an IFU. Of course it doesn't. Or, or a pencil, whatever. Or the ones that have an IP, but they say snappiness things like, oh, just autoplay it. You know, they're here to believe. Uh, kind of uh, according to your normal procedures, like some place in Switzerland does what you're doing and what you're doing. That's crazy, that's incomplete. What about the ones from Europe where they have all, all kinds of details? In fact, they have like, resources required that you don't even have. A sterilizer requires a fractional negative cycle for these. And this type of uh, detergent, you don't even have the resources. But that's not helpful. What about the fourth kind, where the instructions we use are reasonable, uh, they require resources that we routinely have? No big deal. Well, that's the fourth category. What are you going to do with these other three? Because they're out there, they're out there everywhere. And it starts with cleaning. Are you cleaning properly? Well, we just wipe them with cabocide. Well, what do you do at the end of the day? Well, at the end of the day, we put everything in an ultrasound. Oh, that's very convenient for you. So they're operating based on convenience and cost. They're completely making no attempt at all to understand science, regulatory, and legal, which are the four pieces of the puzzle that will keep them out of the national news. They'll keep them credit. They'll keep them patient safety. If they pay attention to the cost slash convenience, got to stay in business, but also the science of what's going on, what the regulatory, what the standards say, and then your legal obligations. So you have to talk to them like that. And basically tell them what we've been saying in the healthcare facility and hospitals for several years now, before trialing, borrowing, or purchasing a reusable medical device, confirm that you have the necessary resources before you. Not after, you know, and of course, those of you are very familiar with sterile processing, that's what typically happens. A new device and condition set shows up. And all of a sudden you're supposed to process it. There's no IFU. Or there is one that falls in maybe one of these three categories and doesn't do this any good at all. So your private office or your clinics are inundated with this. Number three, they're placing devices in an ultrasound, but it's just for one or two minutes. And uh, they're not changing the solution till the end of the day. They say they'll do it at the end of the day. I don't know if they really do it at the end of the day. And then, of course, when, the, when we ask them if they're having testing, they, they look at you like, do you have a clean test? It comes, um, it must be working. Mm, really? Okay. So, what's the best practice? What did the standards say? Well, starting off, follow the manufacturer's IQ for ultrasonic. Can you ultrasonic? Can't tell you how many dental offices like to ultrasonic little inside of a plastic bag, zip up bag. Wait till it goes too fast. They do that for convenience, for convenience. So, if you ask me, did you ultrasonic those devices in those tools? Yeah. Did you ultrasound properly? Is a question. And what about water temperature and water quality? I have no idea. 
They're just using tap water, right? They have treated water. They don't have treated water. Do they need treated water? I can think of, think of three letters to answer that question. I have you. So I have people tell them that treated water is necessary. And what type of treated water? Or a tap water plant. So where's the I have Good luck. You think they don't have one source? You think they're spending three thousand dollars a year so that they can go to one source on their computer and pull up IFUs? There you go. The hospitals who are spending three thousand dollars a year don't even go online anyways. I know because I visit them. I say, "Hey, if you have one source? Yet, could you pull it up?" Oh, I don't know the passwords. You're too you're 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 but if, if the surveyor shows up and asks them, hey, do you have IFUs? It's sure that you have them. Okay. It reminds me of walking in my dental office years ago and seeing a little plaque. It said, hey, we, it said, we comply with CDC guidelines if this is one of the new CDC guidelines. And I said, CDC guidelines are infection control. And I remember asking Felicia, the dental office, the dentist, the wife, was the, she was the business man. I said, hey, Felicia, so when, when did you guys get this plaque? This is fantastic. Who are you? She said, Chuck, I just bought this out of the dental catalog in 19 dollars 95 So they said they were doing something that really was meaningless. They really weren't doing it. So you got to be careful. Whether it's affiliated with your organization, the surveyor is going to come and pick these things off left and right. Or if it's your family and you're sending your children, your grandchildren, your loved ones to them, you have no idea if they're following best practices. I'm here to tell you, assume that they are not. And you know, how many times? When's the last time you were at office for the first time? They want to ask you 30,000 questions. They want to interrogate you. You don't think you have the right to ask them a few basic questions about infection prevention and control? Absolutely, you do. You have a moral obligation to do it to your family. So, the, oh, they will ask you if you're from OSHA. Prepare you for that. That's what. That's the number one question. Are you from OSHA? I, no, no. I, I'm coming in for a consultation. I need a hoop now. I just want to come in ahead of time and, and see how your process is proceeding. I wanted someone to react differently. I want some things he has to Oh, absolutely, we should do. That'd be fantastic. We're so proud of what we do here. One would be a convenient time to be. That's not what I hear on the phone. Are you in motion? That's what I hear. Uh, I'll have to check with the doctor and see if it's okay. We don't normally do that. Really? So, anyways, what's going on in the private office and clinic setting? All kinds of stuff. And then, by the way, here's a tip. The latest Amy SC 79 since I retired, and of course now it's, it's in 2017, it's in there now, says that you're, you're to use a fresh solution in the ultrasonic after you choose. And guess who's included in the scope of Amy SC 79? Hospitals, ambulatory surgery centers, medical and dental offices, all of them in that national state. You think they're, they're changing? They're not. I will give you a caveat though. The healthcare facility shall determine what they consider use. So a high use environment, we're probably are changing constantly. A low use environment may make the determination that they consider use after so many times or whatever. So there's a little caveat there. So that's something that's changed. And testing them, they never heard of testing them. So I, first of all, I start them off with aluminum wrap because they know we're going to get a cost convenience objection. But from a science regulatory legal point of view, I point out that the local hospitals aren't doing this. They graduate up to more sophisticated tests they're available to. But I'd be happy if you just tested with anything. Okay? Because they never heard of tests. But the more you explain it to them, they said, yeah, I probably should just listen for it. Um, maybe I should actually see it. Good. Of course. Do you have a question? Number four. Single use sheet. Those who are wrapping in the medical setting, they'll typically wrap their trays, but it makes no sense at all for them to use more than one sheet from a cost convenience point of view. What do you think the science, the regulatory legal situation says about that? It says you're to follow the IFP, but there is no vat manufacturer being sold to them that says to use a single sheet. They're buying wrap like you wrap, buy a purchase wrap. But they don't buy the, um, like the, uh, the one step you know, product that's all assigned to well, because the number one call a problem with tabletop steroids is overloading. And you overload a steroid with plastic wrap, what do you think happens to the wrap that's touching the side of the steroid? 
it melts. So they don't like that wrap. They want to use paper wrap because paper wrap will not melt when they overload the syrup. See the thought process here? It's all about number one, cost and convenience. So they want to use paper wrap and they just use a single wrap, which is not good enough. But ask him if the wrapping is mentioned the trays over in plant. Yes. Ask him if the wrapping is proper. No. So this happens. And when it comes to actually using a technique for wrapping, it looks a lot like Christmas presents. You. They have no idea. They, they don't realize there's even posters out there like maybe. We'll give you, well, this is how you do it. You use the envelope fold. And here's how you do it. You want to do the sequential using square fold. In other words, there's specific ways of doing it. I saw on a blog the other day, someone was asking about the wrapping and history tray and had like a, like a pull pen. What was that? What was the pull pen? So people are trained, but they're not educated. You know the difference, right? Training is I need you to wrap the engine set. Education is I need you to wrap it properly. In other words, understand why, what's behind it, not just over wrap it. So this is some of the things you're going to run into. Here's number five, pouches. Place them flat on the sterilizer tray. Here's the number of questions you're going to get asked. Denard and I were just talking about this earlier. Uh, do you put plastic bags on or paper bags? Well, you ask 100 people in the industry, 50% say one, 50% say other, which is proper. Or according to best practice, neither one. Our national standards say you put the pouches on edge, right? This is how we validate tabletop sterilizer in the United States. We never put them in here like this, ever. This is common practice. It's not best practice. I was doing a program a few years ago with a large dental society. They had about 200 dental hygienists in the room. There's a young girl sitting back where you're sitting here. And I showed her this picture here. She said, you know, Mr. Hughes, if you get rid of that wrap, you can show a whole lot more options. And bless their hearts, that's by the time. They're going in the room and agree with that. I'm sure you can. That would not be best practice. That would only be common practice. And you certainly would not want a survey to come around to see that. You certainly wouldn't want the attorney for the plaintiff who's suing your facility for non-compliance with infection prevention national standards to know you're doing that. You wouldn't even want your patients to know they're doing that if they knew enough to ask those questions. So loading the sterilizer. Amy has, again, posters. See the posters they have. You can purchase these posters. You can make them, a, you can just send them over to them, have them printed out if they, a, a poor copy from the internet. But you can buy the originals right from Amy. And they'll talk about how you load a sterilizer. Buy items on top, heavy items in the bottom. Peel pouches on edge. Wrap trace. This is exactly what it says in the national standards. Because when you tell them, they're going to say, well, I don't want to do that. I understand from a convenience point of view, you do want to do that. But from a science or regulatory legal point of view, I really need you to be doing that. Especially when we come over with a survey next year or next month or whenever they show up. Well, when are they going to show up? And that's a fun question to answer. Right? When are they going to be here? We'll be right up. That day, we'll do it properly. Well, they don't tell us anymore. In fact, in the day, they did not enough. The FDA used to do surprise inspections on manufacturing. You know what the FDA does today? Call you up to make an appointment. Surveyors used to do that too. Call you up to make an appointment. They both split. The FDA now calls and asks is it convenient time. And your surveyor just show up. <laughs> they give you a window, right? They give you a window. Yeah. And I'm like, wait for the cable guy. They don't give you a window. <laughs> How the cable company's gotten better. Let's only see how you a few hours. So this is what we're running into. Fuel pouches, cassettes, wrap trays. Wrap trays can go this way, or they can go this way, depending on what you've got inside. Which one of these fuel pouches is prepared incorrectly? It's kind of obvious to me. It's obvious to you, right? Is it the one on the left or the one on the right? Which is incorrect? The one on the right. This is common practice. You see what they've done? They've got a fuel pouch that's really not it's oversized, but you just do this. That's a violation of best practice. You do know when the FDA clears a sterilization pouch with a self seal, that when you seal it over, it has to catch 50% paper, 50% plastic. Plus, the seal's not going to have integrity. Now, there's some wiggle room. Sometimes it's 60 40, sometimes it's 65 30. You know, there's a little bit of wiggle room, but there's no wiggle room on this. You see what that means? Ripped it off. Come up here. They, they got fellows on the side. There's no way that would pass shelf life sterility testing. Huh? 
but we see that happening all the time. So ask them, are they pouching their instruments? Yes. Are you pouching them correctly? Uh, what do you mean? Well, for standards, for the IIT, well, I don't know. I just do it the way Julie talks. Who's Julie? Well, she's the one who needs to work through it. So you have a policy procedure on how to pouch and the reference to Julie? No, we don't have a policy. We probably should have a policy procedure on packaging. And this is what really gets my go. Now we're at the sterilizer. Selecting the sterilizer cycle based on packaging. This is from the number one selling sterilizer in the United States. See how the cycles are selected? Not based on parameters, based on packaging. Remember back in the day in the operating room, especially the glass sterilization or immediate use steam sterilization, we don't use the F word anymore. But they used to go and test the P1 cycle or the P2 cycle. He said, well, what about the P1? I said, well, that's for a single issue. What's the P2? Well, that's a transport one. Yeah, but what's actually behind them? I have no idea. It's either P1 or P2 job. You know, I'm not an SDB person. That's what the nurses used to tell me. So you need to know what's behind them, right? Well, now they know. They, they don't push P1 or P2. They, they know it's 270 for four minutes, three vacuum, zero subscribe time, 270, 10 minutes, three vacuum. They know that. You think your clinics know that? They have no idea what the looks like. They just go up here and look what they're doing. If it's in a pouch, if it's unwrapped, you push that button. If it's pouch, you push that button. No matter what's in the pouch. If it's wrapped, you put that button. If it's a hand piece, apparently all hand pieces run the same cycle. This sterilizer says so. Here's a list of some dental hand pieces. I just poked up a few of them on my laptop. And take a look and see if it's true. They all run the same cycle. Well, this one says it's a pre-vacuum or a grab. You have two choices. This one says same thing, but their choices are different. This one says, well, it doesn't say. It just says to steam it. And this one says you can steam or chemical vapor. But look, at, it's just singing temperature. So we have no idea. This one says autoclave it. And this one says according to Amy SP42, that doesn't exist anymore. And it's four minutes or... 16 minutes, not a single one of them are validated to a standard cycle, which I'm validating the table top sterilizer to our standard cycle in my test lab. Not a single one, not one of them. So how would you know the dental hand piece that just used that your loved one just asked earlier this year was done properly on one way? So a lot of them been asking for the IP. You pull up the IP, what's on the cycle? You then go up to the sterilizer, and when you push this button and hold it, it'll tell you the parameters. You can change these parameters. You can go up and down. That's what this button's for. Do you think they ever change them all day long, all week long, all month? No, it's back in the OR 20 years ago when they were pushing P1 or P2. That's the world we live in. Hopefully, my organisms know that they're in a clinical setting, not in a hospital setting, because really only the bad germs are in the hospital. And none of these bad germs make their way out of the medical cells, tattoos, and our veterinarian world. I don't think so. So, we have to teach them IFUs. We have to teach them that compliance with IFUs is really a patient safety issue. Can you think of another important reason other than just patient safety? I've actually mentioned three reasons. You remember what the other one was? It's patient safety, maintain your accreditation, and keeping your facility out of the national mm -hmm. Those are the three things that you can't argue with. But you can educate people on it because they're only trained to not educate them. Mm -hmm. By the way, I love this about CMS. If manufacturer's instructions are not followed, then the outcome of the sterilizer cycle. It's guesswork and the practice should be cited. They're just guessing that that everything they put in the pill pouch. They're just guessing that that. Just guessing. They don't want to guess. You have some varieties. You can probably find them if you did or not for the facility. But they certainly don't have more. Than you. Never heard of one source or any other company that you know, electronically they can provide. And you have to have the same level of standard practice throughout your organization. Removing practices from the sterilizer that are visibly wet. I see this a lot of times too. They don't know that. They think as long as it's peel pops, that's okay. If it comes out wet, they're, they're, the answer you're going to get, a response you're going to get is, well, they're all wet. 
we wouldn't have anything to do if we had to wait for them. So how do you keep them, how do you get them dry? I can think of three letters. I got you, or maybe it tells you the sterilization parameters including dry time. Oh, we just put this letter. So if you don't know the temperature, the exposure time, or the dry time, well, we kind of have an idea how long the cycle is. They're not manipulating anything. And they don't know that they're not supposed to use products that are visibly wet. And they don't know the reason why. So when you tell them, do not use this pack because it's visibly wet, they say, well, we don't have anything to use all day long. But we are packaging our engines because they told us it's important that we pack our We don't just do open tray sterilization anymore and put them in the drawer like they used to do. And you'll find some who would literally sterilize the engines in open trays. You know, like utensils at home. You know how you do the utensils, right? You wash them at home, and then you just, I do this all the time. I love unloading the dishwasher. For me, I just enjoy it. I can see some immediate results. I don't always get to see that in my career. I love to do that. I'm always walking by the kitchen and see if there's a dishwasher. What do I do? I take them out and put them directly into a drawer and close the drawer. That's what they're doing because they think these are just tools, right? They have no respect for the fact because they've only been trained in the academic and it's really important. One facility I went to was doing this because they knew it was important to dry, have these pouches dry before they store them. So this was their answer. We think that was based on uh, legal, regulatory, science, or convenience. Convenience. Number eight, storing sterile packages near sinks and cardboard boxes in high traffic areas. Pretty routine. Pretty routine, to, you know, boxes or if they're packaged. Then of course, they're supposed to the best practice gives all this information what they should be doing. It's a little bit overcrowded here, but it's a lot better than what they were doing before where they were just throwing them in a cardboard box. So what are your facilities doing? You would have no idea unless you visit. Ask them, are you storing your instruments prior to use? Absolutely. Are you storing your properly? What do you mean? Not per standards. I mean, you have a written policy procedure, right? Um, I don't think so. What do you guys do at the hospital? Well, we have a written policy procedure. And we have a you know traffic control, climate control area where we keep them you know properly done. We keep clean and sterile separate. And then number nine is biologically test and sterilizer only once a month versus quarterly. Although I'm at a, a facility just the other day that was sport testing off, my biologically testing off. In fact, the surgeon said to me, the oral surgeon said to me, well, when, did, uh, when did they start recommending that? I said, you mean the 80 days? He goes, yeah, I said, oh, about 20 years ago. You mean the CDC? Uh, about 25 years ago. You've never heard you're supposed to test your sterilants? Well, we use those little strips. We use those little pump change strips. But actually, they had office, the uh, manager office manager told us that she stopped buying those because it's cheaper just to use dog products. You know, the chemical indicator that changes in the trunk of your car and pops in the day when she calls you. She didn't want to buy them with integrators. She was just, you know, wanted to at least have, you know, tell you a little bit more information. And it's biological again. I said, I can't believe that you have a flat on the wall saying you're an approved dental facility here. I mean, who comes by and expects you? Where is the state dental board? Which is really what I got to And it's very unlikely. I'm not saying the whole career. The last person I ever would think of to, to call back I've been there to send was the health department, CDC or CMS or anything. I've never, I'm pumped. I can't say how many times I've turned down lots of money where I could be a, a, an expert witness for the plan that's suing the health care facility. I said, no, no, no. I, you know, there's lots of people who love to do that. I said, I, I like to help. I want to help out the health care facility. Yeah, they're not perfect. But I believe people are inherently good and they're trying to be better. So I thank you, no thanks. I don't want the money and I don't want to eat up all my time. But this is a situation, at least in where I live in Rochester, something's got to be done about this because I just, I mean, that took me forever to find somebody who can even come close to doing this process. And I want to talk to somebody about, hey, they need to improve their survey, they need to improve their auditing, whatever. Because that's what, you know, your Joint Commission and DMV and AAA and C have learned over this, right? They wanted they had to do a better job than what they were doing. And now they're doing a much better job. Well, some of them are. Just when you're all geared up with that real strict survey, you get an old surveyor walks in and doesn't really ask you anything. 
Oh, you didn't step, step their nose in the department just like it was for years. We don't want that. Well, best practice says they're supposed to be testing their sterilizers daily, every load and implant, and three consecutive times after sterilizer failure and major repair. So this is where the tabletop sterilizer repair company gets in. And since they're going to repair it off-site, they should actually do this test before they bring the sterilizer back. But guess what? They're not doing it. And they haven't told the office that they should do it. So it's not being done. So you're paying for repair, but they're not finalizing their QA client. Should be part of your what you're paying for. So I usually tell the doctor, you know, the, the nurse or whoever's in the clinic, I said, when you have your sterilizer service, this is something that you know you should receive a document saying it's passed the test. Of course, they're going to test in an empty sterilizer, and then you're immediately going to test that day in your full load. Which load of the day? Well, picture in your mind's eye what your largest load is for that day. And that's the one I would recommend you test. That, that would be like the worst case. Well, we don't always know. We'll say, well, okay, well, from a regulatory point of view, you need to test. From a science point of view, it's great to be tested in the first case. But that's really what we're looking at. But I would much rather have that conversation than trying to explain to somebody why they're not forecasting at all, which is usually the case. If I, this thing will work. Yeah, there it goes. Sterilizer failure, the most common reason for failure, tabletop sterilizers overloading. Does it surprise you that this fails or this fails? But it doesn't fail in the dental office that's using autoclave tape, does it? It only fails in whatever office that's doing a proper quality control test, like a biological test in the center. But you'll get a lot of pushback on this. Because they'll say, well, wait, wait a minute, you have no idea what our work means. There's no way if we step, if we do it like that, and I'll be here all day, all night. If I do it like this, I get home my kids at night. You better have an answer for that. And it probably is there's three things. Patient safety, the surveyor on its way, and let me show you an article that recently happened in the National News where it was found not to find the CDC guidelines. And CDC guidelines are easy to find. By the way, you're part of this healthcare facility, this organization. We follow Amy National Standards, Amy RC 79. Amy who? Amy RC 79. I'll get you a copy on the internet. And there's a whole lot of things about how your facility is supposed to be set up, how your personnel is supposed to be trained, proper attire hand washing, and how your policies and procedures should be in writing. Written referencing the most current national system. And we have issues with all three of those. In fact, you do so little sterilization here, we're going to be moving sterile. Maybe we try to win the situation like that. I've actually had a case of that occasion too. I have a company that says, Chuck, what do you think about that? It doesn't help us. It helps them because there's no way they're going to have a big setup the way it should be, and they just do such little reprocessing. Why are they doing it all? Why don't we just send a single use of solar? That may be a conclusion if you want to look at this from a cost, science, or legal one. I'm not talking, I don't have a problem with it. But your local dental office is going to do that. Your veterinarian's not going to do that. And a lot of your own medical facilities, you guys, this are not going to do that. So we're not talking about those unusual situations. We're talking about the vast majority of people who are going to continue to reprocess reusable medical devices, and they're going to continue to do the process. Okay. I even had a client once that had an autoclave turned off. So they turned off the steam and that was off. And the nurse went back in and couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. So they turned off the steam on and then pressed the button to stir up. There you go. And if there was a bad outcome later on, and there was somebody interviewing that nurse and they asked, hey, did you sterilize those instruments? Her answer is yes. So that's when you ask them, did you sterilize properly? Would be proper according to best practice that doctor may catch his hands. Oh, well, we never do that. And they'll say that from the attorney to the plane this way and so you say, oh, no, they're going to be honest with us. And that's a question you should ask well before that happens. Well before your surgery gets in. Or correctly, before the next patient walks in. So if you have that responsibility in your organization, it was five dollars. And if you don't find out who does, offer me your assistance. 
Some of you got people out in the industry, like me, so be happy to be one of those new resources, not their only resource, but one of their many resources. And if it's your own personal family, health care facility, you're it. And a hell of a lot better than, than the state health department or the local health department. And you can go in there arm and put an all of it that say hey, you're in the demo officer and write it from in and speak with your office manager and they can give me a walk and they can show me how to process your instruments. There's been a lot in the news lately about facilities not be processing instruments properly. Some of them have been shut down. Others are in lawsuits. You're my family. So I'm sure you're doing everything right. So just so I can tell you. That I check you out. I'd like to do that because I work in a hospital and reprocess instruments on this and that. And for peace of mind, I'd like to go through it. When will we be here next week? Can we come in and spend an hour with me? And I don't understand why they take a hard time for that hour. Because sometimes, just figure out next time you go to a place you haven't been to your tent. Have to see how long it takes just to fill out the forms that they want to fill out the forms. See if I can take an hour to fill out the forms. They want to ask you a thousand questions about who you are. They want your social security number. They want your name, your birth. They want everything. But they don't want to take the time to walk you through what they're doing. That doesn't make any sense at all. The only thing that's unusual about your request is that it's not common practice. They don't get this. So you're going to approach them that it is best practice. Number 10 is they do run a BI, but they run an empty sterilizer during at the facility. And that doesn't do them a lot of good. They're supposed to test what they do. So an empty sterilizer can pass, but what about an overloaded sterilizer? That's what I hope I see. But that's the problem. Oh, we uh, that's what we have the color change tape on that. It always passes. Really. But it passes in the trunk of your car on a hot summer day and it's your golf shoes. That's not a sterile indicator. Can you pass the gold standard? This is what we do at the hospital. We run this every load. I'm asking you to run it every day. Well, specifically, the team said at least at least weekly, preferably daily, in every load and implement. But if they're part of the organization, then you're following AESP 79 that says at least, uh, still says at least weekly, preferably every day. But your policy and procedure says daily or in process of every load. So <coughs> there you have a health agency hospital who's doing daily VI testing. And that would be how fast the VI has become. In fact, a lot of them come to every low test, right? I'd love to talk to you about that all the time, too. So you read the API testing every low? Yeah. Are you testing properly? I don't think so. No, no. I'll be happy to come and show you how you're not properly. You're testing properly. You're testing, but you're not testing properly. It's the same thing everywhere we go. So we want to make sure that also, since it's seen, tell them about the type 5 indicator. Tell them that you could use that with a BI, and if you tell you need it, what's going to happen to the BI that you send out to a lab, or that you still have that 24, 40 hour uh, open technology? Or what about all those other loads? Since you're only test once a day or once a week, that that would be best practice to use some type, not your autoclave tape. They love the convenience and the cost of autoclave tape. They're going to love a type five indicator for a steam sterilizer based on science, regulatory, and legal. But you're going to upgrade them to a BI too when it's time. And lastly, you should be aware that the tabletop sterilizer in the marketplace that you visit right now, your family practice or your facilities are not pre vacuums like they use in hospitals. They could be they could be purchased pre vacuum, but they cost two or three thousand dollars more. If you're only paying two or three thousand dollars for a gravity sterilizer. Why would you pay sixty five hundred for a pre vacuum? Well, it's a faster cycle, faster cycle, more convenient. Some have. The vast majority of North America do not, which really surprised people from Europe because they banned gravity sterilization years ago. You can't sterilize in gravity. Did you know that? Funny, because I validate gravity sterilization all the time. They need to ask them a little further, and you probably just don't like that it takes so long. Oh, so you don't like the inconvenience of a long cycle. So you guys have decided that you're just going to allow only free vacuum. Well, that's my hospital's use free vacuum. But it's not mandated, it's their choice. 
And that's why all the validation of all the instrumentation going and had to look for grab and free back because in the hospital setting, they almost exclusively free back. So you want your IP to show your free back setting, right? So guess what's going to happen when you visit your clinic? And they have a tabletop gravity. It's all those instruments that are validated for, for pre vacuum. Haven't they were validated for gravity? Although I showed you a few demo hand pieces that have that. So you got to make sure that if they move from gravity to pre vacuum, that they're not just doing this and paying no attention to their instrument IP or their packaging IP. Maybe they're using a field pilot. Only so the dental, and so they know it's gravity, so they don't have gravity playing on their field pilot. You have to make sure all this is compatible. You know the challenge it is in a healthcare setting, hospital setting, when something comes in with a grab setting, like a breast cycle. People, I don't know what to do. I don't know. I'm going to have three eggs. I don't know. No, there's a grab in the me, Let me walk you through this. See, it's a real challenge. It's the opposite in the clinic. They only have gravity serializers. And they have to look at a single IP to see if it's gravity or a free guy. Guess what? If it comes from Europe, do you think the instruments are validated for gravity? I don't know, because they're not even allowed to use gravity in Europe. So they only come in with a pre vacuum set in a gravity environment. You think your surveyors can pick up on that? Oh, absolutely. Oh, the only three letters your surveyors know of good ones now is IFP. It's the only three letters they know. The bad one, they'll probably get past them. I don't know. So, and then, of course, the monitoring. A lot of your monitoring, a lot of your indicators, chemical and biological are for one, not the other, some are things. And what about the Bowie Dick test? Question, anybody in the audience, can you answer the question? If I, have, if I move from my gravity to my pre-vacuum sterilizer, do I need to run a daily Bowie Dick test on my tabletop pre-vacuum sterilizer? What do the standards say? I'm getting a nod, yes? Everyone agrees? Reading the SP79 for steam sterilization makes no distinction at all the size of the sterilizer. You know, the sterilizer used in the industry are huge. Sterilizer used, used are much smaller. The ones they're using is small. We make no distinction. It's for a pre vacuum type sterilization cycle that you're going to check the air pump. Do you know how much it's going to cost the private office in clinic to run a daily Bowie deck test each year? About half the cost of the pre vacuum sterilizer. Over three thousand dollars a year. But it costs you guys now a little bit less. You got a little bit better deal than they're going to have. So let me see if I understand this correctly, Chuck. I can buy a, a thirty a thirty five hundred dollar gravity sterilizer and not run that three thousand dollar year test. Or I can run a, or I can buy a sixty five hundred dollar pre vacuum sterilizer and on top of that have three thousand dollars worth of special testing in Um I wonder what they're going to choose to do. Or the distributor who sold them didn't tell them about this. So they've already made this drug, but now they're not going to do a bowling dick test either. They haven't been biologically tested. They didn't have a chemical indicator dog testing, and they don't run a bowling dick. We think your surveyors can think about that. I'm going to shut them down. You're out of business. But they'll keep it secret because they'll never leak out to the you know, like the White House, we can keep secrets. Can't keep secrets in Washington D.C. The White House, for goodness sake, you think someone's not going to find out? But the staff's going to go home and start talking to their friends and their relatives. So next thing you know, the national news or the local news will report we shut down, which will probably get picked up by the national news too. So, right? Okay. So the question is about how about the protected biologicals when we do um, state sterilization in the hospital. That's a great question. Yeah. But they're not going to be sterilized. 
So they let you know they don't have steam coming someplace else. They have self contained steam. So that probably is the deciding factor why the IF for the sterilizing manufacturer to run a warm up cycle. And then go ahead and consider your next cycle <coughs> refer to load today. And that's why I recommend the use of the IF. So they have a zero cycle, cycle number one. It's a pre vacuum, that would be all the X. Cycle number three, it's a pre vacuum, that's your first load of the IF. But the gravity is the most we are the warm up cycle. And cycle number uh, number one, cycle number two is your full load. And then it has your PI. And because there's an accumulation of instrumentation at the end of the day, that probably is the one of the largest load of the day. Okay. Good question. And you should be aware of this that there are cassette sterilizers. These are primarily sold in dental office and in eye surgery. Eye surgery, ambulatory surgery centers. They're pervasive in eye surgery. And while if you want a complete cycle of 270 something for three and a half minutes, that cycle takes about six minutes. If you add on their FDA clear drive time of 60 minutes, it now takes 66 minutes. Ask your eye center has these if they run a 60 minute, 66 minute cycle using a statin sterilizer. The answer is 100% no. I never would have bought this special cassette sterilizer unless I could have gotten it out in six minutes. So we run all the eye entries in that FDA cleared cycle, 270 for three and a half minutes, okay, six minutes start to finish. We take out the set, we take it in the operator. Yes, when we open it up, it's completely wet. But that's an FDA cleared cycle, and we're using it. In fact, uh, a bunch of eye surgeons got together, came to the ADA, and said, we're going to call that a short cycle. The word short cycle doesn't exist in our national standards. Because for convenience reasons, they wanted to keep doing this. And everybody in the Amy means that what you're doing is considered to be the same sterilization. But you run into this with some of these sterilization packaging systems too, like they take it right. Where they have something that said, hey, at least we tested to make sure the water is so sterile. See, when something flies in the face of the national standard, you have to be careful. So this sterilizer is pervasive in ambulatory surgery centers doing eyes, and hospitals doing eyes, and it's pervasive in the general. So we go from these long cycles to a very short cycle. And they come up with the word short cycle. You think your surveyor is going to be looking for a short cycle, or you're going to be looking for immediate use, or um, terminal sterilization. Terminal sterilization is what you're looking for. Because if they're doing anything, it's called immediate use. You're going to be nailed on that. And if it's routinely used for immediate use, that's the department's dead in our industry, right? It's only for emergency. It's routinely done. It's because this tabletop sterilizer, bless their hearts, there's several manufacturers. I validate them all. Will they sterilize? Yes. Can you package them and have them come out dry and go out on the shelf? No. They're designed specifically for the use How are they being used? They're being used for terminal sterilization. And you don't know because no one ever goes and checks and audits and inspects. They avoid their turning high and high sets you know, all day long. They got uh, four instrument set, high set sets, and they got 30 surgeries all day. They got man their turn. Their turn and when we inquire what they're doing, everybody there is going to be In fact, this new technology steroids, they told us specifically we could use it this way. Oh, a sales rep told you to use this product a certain way. And when you wrote your policy and received, you said Joe said, if you certainly aren't going to put down ESP79, but I've seen people about it. All right. Our time almost up. We allowed for a few minutes of questions here in conclusion. Proper medical device reprocessing is a critical aspect of infection control for the reasons we said earlier. I just want to share with you 10 common factors that I've been observing those here are still there and have been out there recently. And it's important to know to follow best practice because regardless of where they're reprocessed, a non-sterile device could be as dangerous as a loaded gun. You should have seen me jump up on a chair in China a couple years ago, 2,000 people in the audience, and I looked at the interpreter and I said, BANG! She looked at me. Bang! And we got the audience twice. You know, once we were a little bit not enough. Not that you all are not enough. Because this is something that I was taught by somebody in my first year in business, Dr. Bertha Lister, who's a wonderful speaker. She used to carry a starter pistol with her, and as she completed her program, 
She said, I'm not necessarily in the OR, it's just dangerous, it's about to die. And she shouldn't be there. I traveled too much, I can't travel here, so I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 now, based on science, we're going to be back up with that. All right, so we got about five more minutes. It's a little past 11. Oh, look, I apologize. No, I'll stick around and answer any questions. Thank you very much. It's been a great job.